Chapter One of Orientations. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lily Brander. Orientations by W. Somerset Maugham. Section One: The Pantilliousness of Don Sebastian. Giomones is the most inaccessible place in Spain. Only one train arrives there in the course of the day and that arrives at two o'clock in the morning only one train leaves it and that starts an hour before sunrise no one has ever been able to discover what happens to the railway officials during the intermediate one and twenty hours a german painter i met there who had come by the only train and had been endeavouring for a fortnight to get up in time to go away told me that he had frequently gone to the station in order to clear up the mystery but had never been able to do so. Yet, from his inquiries, he was inclined to suspect, that was as far as he would commit himself, being a cautious man, that they spend the time in eating garlic and smoking execrable cigarettes. The guide-books tell you that Giomones possesses the eyebrows of Joseph of Arimathea, a cathedral of the greatest quaintness and battlements untouched since their erection in the 14th century, and they strongly advise you to visit it, I recommend you before doing so to add keating's insect powder to your other toilet necessaries i was travelling to madrid in the express train which had been rushing along at the pace of sixteen miles an hour and suddenly it stopped i leaned out of the window asking where we were curmones answered the guard i thought we did not stop at curmones we do not stop at curmones he replied impassively but we are stopping now that may be but we are going on again i had already learned that it was folly to argue with a spanish guard and drawing back my head i sat down but looking at my watch i saw that it was only ten i should never again have a chance of inspecting the eyebrows of joseph of arimathea unless i chartered a special train so seizing the opportunity in my bag i jumped out the only porter told me that every one in Jormones was asleep at that hour and recommended me to spend a night in the waiting room but i bribed him heavily i offered him two pesetas which is nearly fifteen pence and leaving the train to his own devices he shouldered my bag and started off along a stony road we walked into the dark night the wind blowing cold and bitter and the clouds chasing one another across the sky in front i could see nothing but the porter hurrying along bent down under the weight of my bag and the wind blew icily i buttoned up my coat and then i regretted the warmth of the carriage the comfort of my corner and my rug i wished i had peacefully continued my journey to madrid i was on the verge of turning back as i heard the whistling of the train i hesitated but the porter hurried on and fearing to lose him in the night i sprang forwards then the puffing of the engine and then the smoke the bright reflection of the furnace and the train steamed away like abdurrahman i felt that i had flung my scabbard into the flames still the porter hurried on bent down under the weight of my bag and i saw no light in front of me to announce the approach to a town on each side bordering the road were trees and beyond them darkness and great black clouds hastened after one another across the heavens then as we walked along we came to a rough stone cross and lying on the steps before it was a woman with uplifted hands and the wind blew bitter and keen freezing the marrow of one's bones what prayers had she to offer that she must kneel there alone in the night we passed another cross standing up with its outstretched arms like a soul in pain at last a heavier night rose before me and presently i saw a great stone arch passing beneath it i found myself immediately in the town the street was tortuous and narrow, paved with rough cobbles, and it rose steeply, so that the porter bent down beneath his burden, panting. With a bag on his shoulders, he looked like some hunchbacked gnome, a creature of nightmare. On either side rose tall houses, lying crooked and irregular, leaning towards one another at the top, so that one could not see the clouds, and the windows were great, black apertures like giant mouths there was not a light not a soul not a sound 
except that of my own feet and the heavy panting of the porter. We wound through the streets, round corners, through low arches, a long way up the steep cobbles, and suddenly down broken steps. They hurt my feet, and I stumbled and almost fell. But the hunchback walked along nimbly, hurrying ever. Then we came into an open space, and the wind caught us again, and blew through our clothes, so that I shrank up, shivering. And never a soul did we see as we walked on. It might have been the city of the dead. Then, past a tall church, I saw a carved porch, and from the side grim devils grinning down upon me. The porter dived through an arch, and I gripped my way along a narrow passage. At length he stopped, and with a sigh threw down the bag. He beat with his fists against an iron door, making the metal ring. A window above was thrown open, and a voice cried out. The porter answered. There was a clattering down the stairs, an unlocking, and the door was timidly held open, so that I saw a woman, with the light of her candle throwing a strange yellow glare on her face. And so I arrived at the hotel of Hiormonis. My night was troubled by the ghostly crying of the watchman. Protect us, Mary, Queen of Heaven, protect us, Mary. Every hour it rang out stridently as soon as the heavy bells of the cathedral had ceased their clanging, and I thought of the woman kneeling at the cross, and wondered if her soul had found peace. In the morning I threw open the windows, and the sun came dancing in, flooding the room with gold. In front of me the great wall of the cathedral stood grim and grey, and the gargoyles looked savagely across the square. The cathedral is admirable. When you enter, you find yourself at once in darkness, and the air is heavy with incense. But, as your eyes become accustomed to the gloom, you see the black forms of penitents kneeling by pillars, looking towards an altar, and by the light of the painted windows, areados, and the gaunt scenes of an early painter, and aureoles shining dimly. But the gem of the cathedral of Hiormones is the chapel of the Duke de Losas, containing, as it does, the alabaster monument of Don Sebastian Emmanuel de Mantona, Duque de Losas, and of the very illustrious Signora Doña Sodina de Berruguete, his wife. Like everything else in Spain, the chapel is kept locked up, and the guidebook tells you to apply to the porter at the palace of the present duke. I sent a little boy to fetch that worthy, who presently came back announcing that the porter and his wife had gone into the country for the day, but that the duke was coming in person. And immediately I saw walking towards me a little dark man, wrapped up in a big kappa, with the red and blue velvet of the lining flung gaudily over his shoulder. He bowed courteously as he approached, and I perceived that on the crown his hair was somewhat more than thin. I hesitated a little, rather awkwardly, for the guidebook said that the porter exacted a fee of one peseta for opening the chapel. One could scarcely offer sevenpence halfpenny to a duke, but he quickly put an end to all doubt, for, as he unlocked the door, he turned to me and said, The fee is one franc. As I gave it him, he put it in his pocket and gravely handed me a little printed receipt. Baedeker had obligingly informed me that the duchy of Losers was shorn of its splendour, but I had not understood that the present representative added to his income by exhibiting the bones of his ancestors at a franc a head. We entered, and the duke pointed out the groaning of the roof and the tracery of the windows. This chapel contains some of the finest Gothic in Spain, he said. When he considered that I had sufficiently admired the architecture, he turned to the pictures, and with the fluency of a professional guide, gave me their subjects and the names of the artists. Now we come to the tombs of Don Sebastian, the first Duke of Losas, and his spouse, Doña Sodina, not, however, the first Duchess. The monument stood in the middle of the chapel, covered with a great paw of red velvet, so that no economical tourist should see it through the bars of the gate and thus save his peseta. The Duke removed the covering and washed me silently, a slight smile trembling below his little black moustache. The duke and his wife, who was not his duchess, 
lay side by side on a bed of carved alabaster at the corners were four twisted pillars covered with little leaves and flowers and between them bas-reliefs representing love and youth and strength and pleasure as if even in the midst of death death must be forgotten don sebastian was in full armour his helmet was admirably carved with a representation of the battle between the centaurs and the lapathy on the right arm piece were portrayed the adventures of venus and mars on the left the emotions of vulcan but on the breastplate was an elaborate crucifixion with soldiers and women and apostles the visor was raised and showed a stern heavy face with prominent cheekbones sensual lips and massive chin it is very fine i remarked thinking the duke expected some remark people have thought so for three hundred years he replied gravely he pointed out to me the hands of don sebastian the guide books have said that they are the finest hands in spain tourists especially admire the tendons and veins which as you perceive stand out as in no human hand would be possible they say it is the summit of art and he took me to the other side of the monument that i might look at dona sodina they say she was the most beautiful woman of her day he said but in that case the castilian lady is the only thing in spain which has not degenerated she was indeed not beautiful her face was fat and broad like her husband's a short ungraceful nose and a little knobbly chin a thick neck sat dumply on her marble shoulders one could not but hope that the artist had done her an injustice the duke of losas made me observe the dog which was lying at her feet it's a symbol of fidelity he said the guide-book told me she was chaste and faithful if she had been he replied smiling don sebastian would perhaps never have become duque de losas really it is an old history which i discovered one day among some family papers i pricked up my ears and discreetly began to question him are you interested in old manuscripts said the duke come with me and i will show you what i have with a flourish of the hand he waved me out of the chapel and having carefully locked the doors accompanied me to his palace he took me into a gothic chamber furnished with worn french furniture the walls covered with cheap paper offering me a cigarette he opened a drawer and produced a faded manuscript this is the document in question he said those crooked and fantastic characters are terrible i often wonder if the writers were able to read them you are fortunate to be the possessor of such things i remarked he shrugged his shoulders what good are they i would sooner have fifty pesetas than this musty parchment an offer i quickly reckoned it out into english money he would doubtless have taken less but i felt a certain delicacy in bargaining with a duke over his family secrets do you mean it may i er uh... he sprang towards me take it my dear sir take it shall i give you a receipt and so for thirty-one shillings and threepence i obtained the only authentic account of how the frailty of the illustrious signora doña sodina was indirectly the means of raising her husband to the highest dignities in spain don sebastian and his wife had lived together for fifteen years with the entirest happiness to themselves and the greatest admiration of the neighbours people said that such an example of conjugal felicity was not often seen in those degenerate days for even then they prated of the golden age of their grandfathers lamenting their own decadence as behoved good castilians burdened with such a line of noble ancestors the fortunate couple conducted themselves with all imaginable gravity no strange eye was permitted to witness a caress between the lord and his lady or to hear an expression of endearment but every one could see the devotion of don sebastian the look of adoration which filled his eyes when he gazed upon his wife and people said that doña sodina was worthy of all his affection they said that her virtue was only matched by her piety and her piety was patent to the whole world for every day she went to the cathedral at Giormones and remained long immersed in her devotions her charity was exemplary and no beggar ever applied to her in vain 
But even if Don Sebastian and his wife had not possessed these conjugal virtues, they would have been in Hormones persons of note, since not only did they belong to an old and respected family, which was rich as well, but the gentleman's brother was Archbishop of the See, who, when he graced the cathedral city with his presence, paid the greatest attention to Don Sebastian and Doña Sodina. Everyone said that the Archbishop Pablo would shortly become a cardinal, for he was a great favourite with the king, and with the latter his holiness the Pope was then on terms of quite unusual friendship. And in those days, when the priesthood was more noticeable for its gallantry than for its good works, it was refreshing to find so high-placed a dignitary of the church a pattern of Christian virtues, who, notwithstanding his gorgeous habits of life, his retinue, his palaces, record, by his freedom from at least two of the seven deadly sins, the simplicity of the apostles, which the common people have often supposed the perfect state of the minister of God. Don Sebastian had been affianced to Doña Sodina when he was a boy of ten, and before she could properly pronounce the viperish sibilance of her native tongue, when the lady attained her sixteenth year, the pair were solemnly espoused, and the young priest Pablo, the bridegroom's brother, assisted at the ceremony. In these days the union would have been instanced as a triumphant example of the success of the mariage de convenance, but at that time such arrangements were so usual that it never occurred to any one to argue for or against them. Yet it was not customary for a young man of two and twenty to fall madly in love with the bride whom he saw for the first time a day or two before his marriage, and it was still less customary for the bride to give back an equal affection. For fifteen years the couple lived in harmony and contentment, with nothing to trouble the even tenor of their lives and if there was a cloud in their sky, it was that a kindly providence had vouchsafed no fruit to the union. Notwithstanding the prayers and candles which Doña Sodina was known to have offered at the shrine of more than one saint in Spain, who had made that kind of miracle particularly his own. But even felicitous marriages cannot last forever, since if the love does not die, the lovers do, and so it came to pass that Doña Sodina, having eaten excessively of pickled shrimps which the abbess of a highly respected convent had assured her were of great efficacy in the begetting of children took a fever of the stomach as the chronicle inelegantly puts it and after a week of suffering was called to the other world from which as from the pickled shrimps she had always expected much there let us hope her virtues have been rewarded and she rests in peace and happiness when Don Sebastian walked from the cathedral to his house after the burial of his wife, no one saw a trace of emotion on his face, and it was with his wonted grave courtesy that he bowed to a friend as he passed him. Sternly and briefly, as usual, he gave orders that no one should disturb him, and went to the room of Doña Sodina. He knelt on the praying stool, which Doña Sodina had daily used for so many years, and he fixed his eyes on the crucifix hanging on the wall above it. The day passed, and the night passed, and Don Sebastian never moved. No thought or emotion entered him. Being alive, he was like the dead. He was like the dead that linger on the outer limits of hell, with never a hope for the future, dull with the despair that shall last forever and ever and ever. But when the woman who had nursed him in his childhood lovingly disobeyed his order and entered to give him food, she saw no tear in his eye, no sigh of weeping. You are right, he said, painfully rising from his knees. Give me to eat. Listlessly taking the food, he sank into a chair and looked at the bed on which had lately rested the corpse of Doña Sodina. But a kindly nature relieved his unhappiness, and he fell into a weary sleep. When he awoke, the night was far advanced. The house, the town, were filled with silence. All round him was darkness, and the ivory crucifix shone dimly, dimly. Outside the door, a page was sleeping. He woke him and bade him bring light. In his sorrow, 
Don Sebastian began to look at the things his wife had loved. He fingered her rosary and turned over the pages of the half-dozen pious books which formed her library. He looked at the jewels which he had seen glittering on her bosom, the brocades, the rich silks, the clothes of gold and silver that she had delighted to wear, and at last he came across an old breviary which he thought she had lost. How glad she would have been to find it! She had so often regretted it. The pages were musty with their long concealment, and only faintly could be detected the scent which Doña Sardina used yearly to make and strew about her things. Turning over the pages listlessly, he saw some crept writing. He took it to the light. Tonight, my beloved, I come. And the handwriting was that of Pablo, Archbishop of Hormones. Don Sebastian looked at it long. Why should his brother write such words in the breviary of Doña Sodina? He turned the pages, and the handwriting of his wife met his eye, and the words were the same. Tonight, my beloved, I come. As if they were such delight to her that she must write them herself, the breviary dropped from Don Sebastian's hand. The taper, flickering in the draught, threw glaring lights on Don Sebastian's face but it showed no change in it. He sat looking at the fallen breviary, and in his mind at the love which was dead. At last he passed his hand over his forehead, and yet he whispered, I loved thee well. But as the day came he picked up the breviary and locked it in a casket. He knelt again at the praying stool, and lifting his hands to the crucifix, prayed silently. Then he locked the door of Doña Sardina's room, and it was a year before he entered it again. That day the Archbishop Pablo came to his brother to offer consolation for his loss, and Don Sebastian at the parting kissed him on either cheek. The people of Hormones said that Don Sebastian was heartbroken, for from the date of his wife's interment he was not seen in the streets by day. A few, returning home from some riot, had met him wandering in the dead of the night, but he passed them silently by. But he sent his servants to Toledo and Burgos, to Salamanca, Cordoba, even to Paris and Rome, and from all these places they brought him books, and day after day he studied in them, till the common folk asked if he had turned magician. So passed eleven months, and nearly twelve, till it wanted but five days to the anniversary of the death of Doña Sardina. Then Don Sebastian wrote to his brother the letter which for months he had turned over in his mind. Seeing the instability of all human things, and the uncertain length of our exile upon earth, I have considered that it is evil for brothers to remain so separate. Therefore I implore you, who are my only relative in this world, and heir to all my goods and estates, to visit me quickly, for I have a presentiment that death is not far off, and I would see you before we are parted by the immense sea. The archbishop was thinking that he must shortly pay a visit to his cathedral city, and, as his brother had desired, came to Hormones immediately. On the anniversary of Doña Sodina's interment, Don Sebastian entertained Archbishop Pablo to supper. My brother, said he, to his guest, I have lately received from Cordova a wine which I desire you to taste. It is very highly prized in Africa, whence I am told it comes, and it is made with curious art and labour. Glass cups were brought, and the wine poured in. The Archbishop was a connoisseur, and held it between the light and himself, admiring the sparkling clearness and then inhaled the odour. It is nectar, he said. At last he sipped it. The flavour is very strange. He drank deeply. Don Sebastian looked at him and smiled as his brother put down the empty glass. But when he was himself about to drink, the cup fell between his hands and the steward's, breaking into a hundred fragments, and the wine spilled on the floor. Fool, cried Don Sebastian and is in anger struck the servant. But being a man of peace, the archbishop interposed. Do not be angry with him. It was an accident. There is more wine in the flagon. 
No, I will not drink it, said Don Sebastian, wrathfully. I will drink no more tonight. The archbishop shrugged his shoulders. When they were alone, Don Sebastian made a strange request. My brother, it is a year today that Sordina was buried, and I have not entered her room since then. But now I have a desire to see it. Will you come with me? The archbishop consented, and together they crossed the long corridor that led to Doña Sordina's apartment, preceded by a boy with lights. Don Sebastian unlocked the door, and taking the taper from the page's hand, entered. The archbishop followed. The air was chill and musty, and even now an odour of recent death seemed to pervade the room. Don Sebastian went to a casket, and from it took a breviary. He saw his brother start as his eye fell on it. He turned over the leaves till he came to a page on which was the archbishop's handwriting, and handed it to him. Oh, God! exclaimed the priest, and looked quickly at the door. Don Sebastian was standing in front of it. He opened his mouth to cry out, but Don Sebastian interrupted him. Do not be afraid. I will not touch you. For a while they looked at one another silently, one pale, sweating with terror, the other calm and grave as usual. At last, Don Sebastian spoke hoarsely. Did she? Did she love you? Oh, my brother, forgive her. It was long ago, and she repented bitterly, and I, I, I have forgiven you. The words were said so strangely that the archbishop shuddered. What did he mean? Don Sebastian smiled. You have no cause for anxiety. From now it is finished. I will forget. And opening the door, he helped his brother across the threshold. The archbishop's hand was clammy as a hand of death. When Don Sebastian bade his brother good night, he kissed him on either cheek. The priest returned to his palace, and when he was in bed, his secretary prepared to read to him, as was his wont, but the archbishop sent him away, desiring to be alone. He tried to think, but the wine he had drunk was heavy upon him, and he fell asleep. But presently he awoke, feeling thirsty. He drank some water. Then he became strangely wide awake. A feeling of uneasiness came over him as of some threatening presence behind him. And again he felt the thirst. He stretched out his hand for the flagon, but now there was a mist before his eyes and he could not see. His hand trembled so that he spilled the water, and the uneasiness was magnified till it became a terror, and the thirst was horrible. He opened his mouth to call out, but his throat was dry so that no sound came. He tried to rise from his bed, but his limbs were heavy and he could not move. He breathed quicker and quicker, and his skin was extraordinarily dry. The terror became an agony. It was unbearable. He wanted to bury his face in the pillows to hide it from him. He felt the hair on his head hard and dry, and it stood on end. He called to God for help, but no sound came from his mouth. Then the terror took shape and form, and he knew that behind him was standing Doña Sardina, and she was looking at him with terrible, reproachful eyes. And a second Doña Sardina came and stood at the end of the bed, and another came by her side, and the room was filled with them. And his thirst was horrible. He tried to moisten his mouth with spittle, but the source of it was dry. Cramps seized his limbs, so that he reeved with pain. Presently a red glow fell upon the room, and it became hot and hotter, till he gasped for breath. It blinded him, but he could not close his eyes, and he knew it was the glow of hellfire, for in his ears rang the groans of souls in torment, and among the voices he recognized that of Doña Sodina, and then, then he heard his own voice, and, in the livid heat, he saw himself in his episcopal ropes, lying on the ground, chained to Doña Sodina, hand and foot. And he knew that as long as heaven and earth should last, the torment of hell would continue. When the priests came into their master in the morning, they found him lying dead, with his eyes wide open, staring with a ghastly brilliancy into the unknown. Then there was weeping and lamentation, 
and from house to house the people told one another that the archbishop had died in his sleep the bells were set toiling and as don sebastian in his solitude heard them referring to the chief ingredient of that strange wine from cordova he permitted himself the only jest of his life it was belladonna that sent his body to the worms and it was belladonna that sent his soul to hell the chronicle does not say whether the thought of his brother's heritage had ever entered don sebastian's head but the fact remains that he was so heir and the archbishop had gathered the loaves and fishes to such purpose during his life that his death made don sebastian one of the wealthiest men in spain the simplest actions in this world o martin tupper have often the most unforeseen results now don sebastian had always been ambitious and his changed circumstances made him realize more clearly than ever that his marriage was worthy of a brilliant arena the times were propitious for the old king had just died and a new one had sent away the army of priests and monks which had turned every day into a sunday people said that god almighty had had his day and that the heathen deities had come to rue in his stead from all corners of spain gallants were coming to enjoy the sunshine and every one who could make a compliment or a graceful bow was sure of a welcome so don sebastian prepared to go to madrid but before leaving his native town he thought well to appease a possibly vengeful providence by erecting in the cathedral a chapel in honour of his patron saint not that he thought the saints would trouble themselves about the death of his brother even though the causes of it were not entirely natural but don sebastian remembered that pablo was an archbishop and the fact caused him a certain anxiety he called together architects and sculptors and ordered them to erect an edifice befitting his dignity and being a careful man as all spaniards are thought he would serve himself as well as the saint and bade the sculptors make an image of doña sodina and an image of himself in order that he might use the chapel also as a burial place to pay for this don sebastian left the revenue of several of his brother's farms and then with a peaceful conscience set out for the capital at madrid he laid himself out to gain the favour of his sovereign and by dint of unceasing flattery soon received much of the king's attention and presently philip deigned to ask his advice on petty matters and since don sebastian took care to advise as he saw the king desired the latter concluded that the courtier was a man of stamina and ability and began to consult him on matters of state don sebastian opined that the pleasure of the prince must always come before the welfare of the nation and the king was so impressed with his sagacity that one day he asked his opinion on a question of precedence to the indignation of the most famous councillors in the land but the haughty soul of don sebastian chafed because he was only one among many favourites the court was full of flatterers as assiduous and as obsequious as himself his proud castilian blood could brook no companions but one day as he was moodily waiting in the royal antechamber thinking of these things it occurred to him that a certain profession had always been in great honour among princes and he remembered that he had a cousin of eighteen who was being educated in a convent near Hormones. she was beautiful with buoyant heart he went to his house and told his steward to fetch her from the convent at once within a fortnight she was at madrid mercia was presented to the queen in the presence of philip and don sebastian noticed that the royal eye lighted up as he gazed on the bashful maiden then all the proud castilian had to do was to shut his eyes and allow the king to make his own opportunities within a week mercia was created maid of honour to the queen and don sebastian was seized with an indisposition which confined him to his room the king paid his court royally which is boldly and doña mercia had received in a convent too religious an education not to know that it was her duty to grant the king whatever it graciously pleased him to ask when don sebastian recovered from his illness he found the world as he fit for every one was talking of the king's new mistress and it was taken as a matter of course that her cousin and guardian should take a prominent part in the affairs of the country but don sebastian was furious he went to the king and bitterly approached him for thus dishonouring him 
Philip was a humane and generous-minded man, and understood that with a certain temperament it might be annoying to have one's ward philander with a king, so he did his best to console the courtier. He called him his friend and brother. He told him he would always love him, but Don Sebastian would not be consoled, and nothing would comfort him except to be made high admiral of the fleet. Philip was charmed to settle the matter so simply, and as he delighted in generosity, when to be generous caused him nothing. He also created Don Sebastian Duke of Losas, and gave him, into the bargain, the hand of the richest heiress in Spain. And that is the end of the story of the punctiliousness of Don Sebastian. With his second wife he lived many years, beloved of his sovereign, courted by the world, honoured by all, till he was visited by the destroyer of delights and the leveller of the grandeur of his world. Towards the evening, the Duke of Losas passed my hotel, and seeing me at the door, asked if I had read the manuscript. I thought it interesting, I said, a little coldly, for, of course, I knew no Englishman would have acted like Don Sebastian. He shrugged his shoulders. It is not half so interesting as a good dinner. At these words, I felt bound to offer him such hospitality as the hotel afforded. I found him a very agreeable messmate. He told me the further history of his family which nearly became extinct at the end of the last century, since the only son of the seventh duke had, unfortunately, not been born of any duchess. But Ferdinand, who was then king of Spain, was unwilling that an ancient family should die out, and was, at the same time, sorely in want of money. So the titles and honours of the house were continued to the son of the seventh duke, and King Ferdinand built himself another palace. But now, said my guest, mournfully shaking his hat it is finished my palace and a few acres of barren rock are all that remain to me of the lands of my ancestors and i am the last of the line but i bade him not despair he was a bachelor and a duke and not yet forty i advised him to go to the united states before they put a duty on foreign noblemen this was before the war and i recommended him to take maida vale and manchester on his way Personally, I gave him a letter of introduction to an heiress of my acquaintance at Hampstead, for even in these days it is not so bad a thing to be Duchess of Losers, and the present Duke has no brother. End of section 1 Section 2 of Orientations This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lily Brander. Orientations by W. Somerset Maugham. Section 2. A Bad Example. Part 1. James Clinton was a clerk in the important firm of Haynes, Bryan and Company, and he held in it an important position. He was the very essence of respectability, and he earned one hundred and fifty-six pounds per annum. James Clinton believed in the Church of England and the Conservative Party, in the greatness of Great Britain, in the need of more ships for the navy, and in the superiority of city men to other members of the Commonwealth. It's the man of business that makes the world go round. He was in the habit of saying, Do you think, sir, the fifty thousand country squires could rule Great Britain? No, it's the city man, the man who's at a sound business training that's made England what it is, and that is why I hold the Conservative Party most capable of governing this mighty empire, because it has taken the business man to his heart. The strength of the Conservative Party lies in its brewers and its city men, its bankers and iron founders and stockbrokers, and as long as the Liberal Party is a nest of socialists and trade unionists, and anarchists we city men cannot and will not give it our support except for the lamentable conclusion of his career he would undoubtedly have become an imperialist and the union of great anglo-saxon races would have found in him the sturdiest of supporters mr clinton was a little spindly shranked man with weak myopic eyes protruding fish-like behind his spectacles his hair was scant one long to conceal the baldness of the crown 
and Caesar was pleased to wear a wreath of laurel for the same purpose. Mr. Clinton wore small side whiskers, but was otherwise clean-shaven, and the lack of beard betrayed the weakness of his mouth. His teeth were decayed and yellow. He was always dressed in a black tail coat, shiny at the elbows, and he wore a shabby, narrow black tie, with a false diamond stuck in his sticky. His grey trousers were baggy at the knees and frayed at the edges. His boots had a masculine and English breadth of toe. His top hat, of antiquated shape, was kept carefully brushed, but always looked as if it were suffering from a recent char. When he had deserted the frivolous byways in which bachelordom is wont to disport itself for the sober path of the married man, he had begun to carry to and from the city a small black bag to impress upon the world at large his eminent respectability. Mr. Clinton was married to Amy, second daughter of John Rayner, Esquire, of Peckham Rhine. Every morning, Mr. Clinton left his house in Camberwell in time to catch the A55 train for the city. He made his way up Ludgate Hill, walking sideways, with a projection of the left part of his body, a habit he had acquired from constantly slipping past and between people who walked less rapidly than himself. Such persons always annoyed him. If they were not in a hurry, he was, and they had no right to obstruct the way and it was improper for a city man to loiter in the morning. The luncheon hour was the time for loitering. No one was then in haste. But in the morning and at night, on the way back to the station, when ought to walk at the same pace as everybody else. If Mr. Clinton had been head of a firm, he would never have had in his office a man who sauntered in the morning. If a man wanted to loiter, let him go to the West End, there he could lounge about all day but the city was meant for business and there wasn't time for west end airs and the city mr clinton reached his office at a quarter to ten except when the train by some mistake arrived up to time when he arrived at nine thirty precisely on these occasions he would sit in his room with the door open awaiting the coming of the office boy who used to arrive two minutes before Mr. Clinton, and was naturally more annoyed when the punctuality of the train prepared him a reprimand. "'Is that you, Dake?' called Mr. Clinton, when he heard a footstep. "'Yes, sir,' answered the boy, appearing. Mr. Clinton looked up from his nails, which he was paring with a pair of pocket scissors. "'What is the meaning of this? You don't call this half-past nine, do you?' "'Very sorry,' said the boy. "'It wasn't my fault, sir.' train was late it's not the first time i've had to speak to you about this dick you know quite well that the company's always unpunctual you should come by an earlier train the office boy looked sulky and did not answer mr clinton proceeded i had to open the office myself as assistant manager you know quite well that it is not my duty to open the office you receive sixteen shillings a week to be here at half past nine, and if you don't feel yourself capable of performing the duties for which you were engaged, you should give notice. Don't let it occur again. But usually, on arriving, Mr. Clinton took off his tail coat and put on a jacket, manufactured from the office paper a pair of false calves to keep his own clean, and having examined the nips in both his pen holders and sharpened his pencil, set to work. From then to one o'clock, he remained at his desk, solemnly poring over figures, casting accounts, comparing balance sheets, writing letters, occasionally going for some purpose or another into the clerk's office or into the room of one of the partners. At one, he went to luncheon, taking with him the portion of his daily telegraph which he was in the habit of reading during that meal. He went to an ABC shop and ordered a row and butter a cup of chocolate and a scone. He divided his pats of butter into two, one half being for the roll and the other for the scone. He drank one moiety of the cup of chocolate after eating the roll, and the other after eating the scone. Meanwhile, he read pages three and four of the Daily Telegraph. At a quarter to two, he folded the paper, put down sixpence in payment, and slowly walked back to the office. He returned to his desk, and there spent the afternoon solemnly, poring over figures, 
casting accounts comparing balance sheets writing letters occasionally going for some purpose or another into the clerk's office or into the room of one of the partners at ten minutes to six he wiped his pens and put them back in the tray tidied his desk and locked his drawer he took off his paper cuffs washed his hands wiped his face brushed his hair arranging the long wisps over the occipital baldness, and combed his whiskers at six he left the office caught the six seventeen train from ludgate hill and thus made his way back to camberwell and the bosom of his family on sunday mr clinton put on sunday clothes and heading the little procession formed by mrs clinton and the two children went to church carrying in his hand a prayer book and a hymn book after dinner he took a little walk with his wife along the neighbouring roads avenues and crescents examining the exterior of the houses stopping now and then to look at a garden or a well-kept house or trying to get a peep into some room mr and mrs clinton criticised as they went along comparing the window curtains blaming a door in want of paint praising a well-whitened doorstep the clintons lived in the fifth house down in the adonis road and the house was distinguishable from its fellows by the yellow curtains with which mrs clinton had furnished all the windows mrs clinton was a woman of taste before marriage the happy pair accompanied by mrs clinton's mother had gone house hunting and fixed on the adonis road which was cheap respectable and near the station mrs clinton would dearly have liked a house on the right-hand side of the road which had nooks and angles and curiously shaped windows but mr clinton was firm in his refusal and his mother-in-law backed him up i dare say they're artistic he said in answer to his wife's argument but a man in my position don't want art he wants substantiality if the governor the governor was the senior partner of the firm if the governor was going to take her out, I'd have nothing to say against it, but in my position, art's not necessary. Quite right, James, said his mother-in-law. I ought with what you say, entirely. Even in his early youth, Mr. Clinton had a fine sense of the responsibility of life, and a truly English feeling for the fitness of things. So the Clintons took one of the twenty-three similar houses on the left-hand side of the street, and there lived in peaceful happiness but mr clinton always pointed the finger of scorn at the houses opposite and he never rubbed the back of his hands so heartily as when he could point out to his wife that such and such a number was having his roof repaired and when the builder went bankrupt he cut out the notice in the paper and sent it to his spouse anonymously at the beginning of august mr clinton was accustomed with his wife and family, to desert the sultry populousness of London for the solitude and sea air of Ramsgate. He read the Daily Telegraph by the sad sea waves, and made castles in the sand with his children. Then he changed his pepper and salt trousers for white flannel, but nothing on earth would induce him to forsake his top hat. He entirely agreed with the heroes of England's proudest epoch, of course, I mean the middle Victorian, that the top hat was the sign manual, the mark, the distinction of the true Englishman, the completest expression of England's greatness. Mr. Clinton despised all foreigners, and although he would never have ventured to think of himself in the same breath with an English lord, he felt himself the superior of any foreign nobleman. I dare say they're all right in their way, but with these foreigners who don't feel they're gentlemen, I don't know what it is, but there's something, you understand, don't you? And I do like a man to be a gentleman. I thank God I'm an Englishman. Now, it chanced one day that the senior partner of the firm was summoned to serve on a jury at the coroner's inquest, and Mr. Clinton, furnished with the excuse that Mr. Haynes was out of time, was told to go in his stead. Mr. Clinton had never performed that part of a citizen's duties, for on becoming a householder, he had hit upon the expedient of being summoned for his raise, so that his name should be struck off the coroner's list. It was very indifferent to the implied dishonour, 
it was with some curiosity therefore that he repaired to the court on the morning of the inquest the weather was cold and grey and a drizzling rain was falling mr clinton did not take a bus since by walking he could put in his pocket the threepence which he meant to charge the firm for his fare the streets were wet and muddy and people walked close against the houses to avoid the splash of passing vehicles mr clinton thought of the jocose solicitor who was in the habit of taking an articled clerk with him on muddy days to walk on the outside of the street and protect his master from the flying mud the story particularly appealed to mr clinton that solicitor must have been a fine man of business as he walked leisurely along under his umbrella mr clinton looked without envy upon the city men who drove along in hansoms some of us he said are born great others achieve greatness a man like that he pointed with his mind's finger at a passing elderman a man like that can go about in his carriage and nobody can say anything against it he's worked himself up from the bottom but when he came down parliament street to westminster abbey he felt a different atmosphere and he was roused to jeremiah indignation at the sight in the passing cap of a gilded youth in an opera hat with his coat buttoned up to hide his dress clothes that's the sort of young fellow i can't abide said mr clinton and if i was a member of parliament i'd stop it that's what comes of having too much money and nothing to do if i was a member of the aristocracy i'd give my sons five years in an accountant's office there's nothing like a sound business training for making a man he paused in the road and waved his disengaged hand now what should i be if i hadn't had sound business training mr clinton arrived at the mortuary a gay red and white building which had been newly erected and consecrated by a duke with much festivity and rejoicing mr clinton was sworn with the other jurymen and with them prepared to see the bodies on which they were to sit but mr clinton was squeamish i don't like corpses he said i object to them on principle he was told he must lick them very well said mr clinton you can take a horse to the well but you can't make him drink when it came to his turn to look through the pane of glass behind which was the body he shut his eyes i can't say mixed dragon and copses he said as they walked back to the court the smell of them ain't what you might call all the gloom the other jurymen laughed mr clinton often said witty things like that well gentlemen said the coroner rubbing his hands we've only got three cases this morning so i shan't have to keep you long and they all seem to be quite simple the first was an old man of servity he had been a respectable hard-working man till two years before when the paralytic stroke had rendered one side of him completely powerless he lost his work he was alone in the world his wife was dead and his only daughter had not been heard of for thirty years and gradually he had spent his little savings one by one he sent his belongings to the pawn-shop his pots and pens his clothes his armchair finally his bestead then he died the doctor said the man was terribly emaciated his stomach was shrivelled up for want of food he could have eaten nothing for two days before death the jury did not trouble to leave the box the foreman merely turned round and whispered to them a minute they all nodded and the verdict was returned in accordance with the doctor's evidence the next inquiry was upon a child of two the coroner leaned his hat wearily on his hand such cases were so common the babe's mother came forward to give her evidence a pale little woman with thin and hollow cheeks her eyes red and dim with weeping she sobbed as she told the coroner that her husband had left her and she was obliged to support herself and two children she was out of work and food had been rather scanty she had suckled the dead baby as long as she could but her milk dried up two days before on waking up in the morning the child she held in her arms was cold and dead the doctor shrugged his shoulders want of food and the jury returned their verdict framed in a beautiful and elaborate sentence in accordance with the evidence 
the last case was a girl of twenty she had been found in the thames a barge told how he saw a confused black mass floating on the water and he put a boat hook in the skirt tying the body up to the boat while he called the police he was so used to such things in the girl's pocket was found a pathetic little letter to the coroner begging his pardon for the trouble she was causing saying she had been sent away from her place and was starving and had resolved to put an end to her troubles by throwing herself in the river she was pregnant the medical man stated that there were signs on the body of very great privation so the jury returned a verdict that the deceased had committed suicide whilst in a state of temporary insanity the coroner stretched his arms and blew his nose and the jury went their way but mr clinton stood outside the mortuary door meditating and the coroner's office remarked that it was a wet day could i have another look at the bodies timidly asked the clerk stirring himself out of his contemplation the coroner's officer looked at him with surprise and laughed yes if you like mr clinton looked through the glass windows at the bodies and he carefully examined their faces he looked at them one after another slowly and it seemed as if he could not tear himself away finally he turned round his face was very pale and it had quite a strange expression on it he felt very sick thank you he said to the coroner's officer and walked away but after a few steps he turned back touching the man on the arm do you have many cases like that he asked why you look quite upset said the coroner's officer with amusement i can see you're not used to such things you'd better go to the pub opposite and have three pots of brinze they seem to rather painful cases said mr clinton in a low voice oh it was a slack day today nothing like what it is usually this time of year they all died of starvation starvation and nothing else i suppose they did more or less replied the officer do you have many cases like that starvation cases lord bless you on a every day we'll have half a dozen easy oh said mr clinton well i must be getting on with my work said the officer they were standing on the doorstep and he looked at the public house opposite but mr clinton paid no further attention to him he began to walk slowly away citywards well you are a rummy old file said the coroner's officer but presently a mist came before mr clinton's eyes everything seemed suddenly extraordinary he had an intense pain and he felt himself falling he opened his eyes slowly and found himself sitting on the doorstep a policeman was shaking him asking what his name was a woman standing by was holding his top hat he noticed that his trousers were muddy and mechanically he pulled out his handkerchief and began to wipe them he looked vacantly at the policeman asking questions the woman asked him if he was better he motioned her to give him his hat he put it feebly on his head and staggering to his feet walked unsteadily away the rain drizzled down impassively and caps passing swiftly splashed up the yellow mat mr clinton went back to the office it was his boast that for ten years he had never missed a day but he was dazed he did his work mechanically and so distracted was he that on going home in the evening he forgot to remove his paper cuffs and his wife remarked upon them while they were supping mrs clinton was a short stout person with an appearance of immense determination her black shiny hair was parted in the middle the parting was broad and very white severely brushed back and gathered into a little knot at the back of the head her face was red and strongly lined her eyes spirited her nose aggressive her mouth resolute every one has some one procedure which seems most exactly to suit him a slim youth bathing in a shaded stream an elder man standing with his back to the fire and his thumbs in the armholes of his waistcoat and mrs clinton expressed her complete self exhibiting every trait and attribute 
on sunday in church when she sat in the front pew self-reliantly singing the hymns in the wrong key it was then that she seemed more than ever the personification of a full stop her morals were about suspicion and her religion low church they've moved into the second house down she remarked to her husband and mrs tilly's taken our summer curtains down at last mrs clinton spent most of her time in watching her neighbours movements and she and her husband always discussed at the supper table the events of the day but this time he took no notice of her remark he pushed away his cold meat with an expression of disgust you don't seem up to the mark to-night jimmy said mrs clinton i served on a jury to-day in place of the governor and it gave me rather a turn why was there anything particular mr clinton crumbled up his bread rolling it about on the table only some poor thing starved to death mrs clinton shrugged her shoulders why couldn't they go to the workhouse i wonder i've no patience with people like that mr clinton looked at her for a moment then rose from the table well dear i think i'll get to bed i dare say i shall be all right in the morning that's right said mrs clinton you get to bed and i'll bring you something hot i expect you've got a bit of a chill and a good perspiration and do you a world of good she mixed bad whisky with harmless water and stood over her husband while he patiently drank the boiling mixture then she piled a couple of extra blankets on him and went downstairs to have her usual nip scotch and cold before going to bed herself all night mr clinton tossed from side to side the heat was unbearable and he threw off the clothes his restlessness became so great that he got out of bed and walked up and down the room a pathetically ridiculous object in his flannel nightshirt from which his thin legs protruded grotesquely going back to bed he fell into an uneasy sleep but waking or sleeping he had before his eyes the faces of the three horrible bodies he had seen at the mortuary he could not blot out the image of the thin baby face with the pale open eyes the white face drawn and thin hideous in this starved dead shapelessness and he saw the drawn wrinkled face of the old man with a stubbly beard looking at it he felt the long pain of hunger the agony of the hopeless morrow but he shuddered with terror at the thought of the drowned girl with the sunken eyes the horrible discoloration of petrifaction and mr clinton buried his face in his pillow sobbing sobbing very silently so as not to wake his wife the morning came at last and found him feverish and parched unable to move mrs clinton sent for the doctor a slow cautious scotchman in whose wisdom mrs clinton implicitly relied since he always agreed with her own idea of her children's ailments this prudent gentleman ventured to assert that mr clinton had caught cold and had something wrong with his lungs then promising to send medicine and come again next day went off on his rounds mr clinton grew worse he became delirious when his wife smoothing his pillow asked him how he felt he looked at her with glassy eyes lord bless you he muttered on a heavy day we'll have half a dozen easy what's this he's talking about said the doctor next day he was serving on a jury the day before yesterday and my opinion is that it's got on his brain answered mrs clinton oh that's nothing you needn't worry about that i dare say he'll turn to clothes or religion before he's done People talk of funny things when they are in that state. He probably think he's got two hundred pairs of trousers or a million pounds a year. A couple of days later, the doctor came to the final conclusion that it was a case of typhoid, and pronounced Mr. Clinton very ill. He was indeed. He lay for days between life and death on his back, looking at people with dull, unknowing eyes, clutching feebly at the bedclothes and for hours he would mutter strange things to himself so quietly that one could not hear but at last damn nature and the scotch doctor conquered the microbes and mr clinton became better one day mrs clinton was talking to a neighbour in the bedroom 
The patient was so quiet that they thought him asleep. Yes, I've had the time with him, I can tell you, said Mrs. Clinton. No one knows what I've gone through. Well, I must say, said the friend, you haven't spared yourself. You've nursed him like a professional nurse. Mrs. Clinton crossed her hands over her stomach and looked at her husband with self-satisfaction. But Mr. Clinton was awake, staring in front of him with wide-open, fixed eyes. Various thoughts confusedly ran through his head. "'Isn't he looking strange?' whispered Mrs. Clinton. The two women kept silence, watching him. "'Amy, are you there?' asked Mr. Clinton suddenly, without turning his eyes. "'Yes, dear. Is there anything you want?' Mr. Clinton did not reply for several minutes. The women waited in silence. "'Bring me a Bible, Amy,' he said at last. "'Bible, Jimmy?' asked Mrs. Clinton, in astonishment. "'Yes, dear.' She looked anxiously at her friend. "'Oh, I do hope the delirium isn't coming on again,' she whispered, and pretending to smooth his pillow, she passed her hand over his forehead to see if it was hot. "'Are you quite comfortable, dear?' she asked without further allusion to the Bible. Yes, Amy, quite. Don't you think you could go to sleep for a little while? I don't feel sleepy. I want to read. Will you bring me the Bible? Mrs. Clinton looked helplessly at her friend. She feared something was wrong, and she didn't know what to do. But the neighbour, with a significant look, pointed to the Daily Telegraph, which was lying on a chair. Mrs. Clinton brightened up and took it to her husband. Here's the paper, dear. Mr. Clinton made a slight movement of irritation. I don't want it. I want the Bible. Mrs. Clinton looked at her friend more helplessly than ever. I've never known he mask for such a thing before, she whispered. And he's never missed reading the telegraph a single day since we was married. I don't think you ought to read, she said aloud to her husband. But the doctor will be here soon, and I'll ask him then. The doctor stroked his chin thoughtfully. I don't think there'd be any harm in letting him have a Bible, he said. But you'd better keep an eye on him. I suppose there's no insanity in the family? No, doctor, not as far as I know. I've always heard that my mother's uncle was very eccentric, but that wouldn't account for this, because we wasn't related before we married. Mr. Clinton took the Bible, and turning to the New Testament, began to read. He read chapter after chapter, pausing now and again to meditate, or reading a second time some striking passage, till at last he finished the first gospel. Then he turned to his wife. Amy, do you know, I think I should like to do something for my fellow creatures. I don't think we are meant to live for ourselves alone in this world. Mrs. Clinton was quite overcome. She turned away to hide the tears which suddenly filled her eyes, but the shock was too much for her, and she had to leave the room so that her husband might not see her emotion. She immediately sent for the doctor. Oh, doctor, she said, her voice broken with sobs. I'm afraid. I'm afraid my poor husband's going off his head. And she told him of the incessant reading and the remark Mr. Clinton had just made. The doctor looked grave and began thinking. You're quite sure there's no insanity in the family? He asked again. Not to the best of my belief, doctor. And you've noticed nothing strange in him. His mind hasn't been running on money or clothes. No, doctor. I wish he had. I shouldn't have thought anything of that. There's something natural in a man talking about stocks and shares and trousers, but I've never heard him say anything like this before. He was always a wonderfully steady man. Mr. Clinton became daily stronger, and soon he was quite well. He resumed his work at the office, and in every way seemed to have regained his old self. He gave utterance to no more startling theories, and the casual observer might have noticed no difference between him and the model clerk of six months back. But Mrs. Clinton had received too great a shock to look upon her husband with casual eyes, and she noticed in his manner an alteration which disquieted her. He was much more silent than before. He would take his supper without speaking a word, 
without making the slightest sigh to show that he had heard some remark of mrs clinton's he did not read the paper in the evening as he had been used to do but would go upstairs to the top of the house and stand by an open window looking at the stars he had an enigmatical way of smiling when mrs clinton could not understand then he had lost his old punctuality he would come home at all sorts of hours and when his wife questioned him would merely shrug his shoulders and smile strangely once he told her that he had been wandering about looking at men's lives mrs clinton thought that a very unsatisfactory explanation of his unpunctuality and after a long consultation with the cautious doctor came to the conclusion that it was her duty to discover what her husband did during the long time that elapsed between his leaving the office and returning home and so one day at about six she stationed herself at the door of the big building in which were mr clinton's offices and waited presently he appeared in the doorway and after standing for a minute or two on the threshold eva with the enigmatical smile hovering on his lips came down the steps and walked slowly along the crowded street his wife walked behind him and it was not difficult to follow for he had lost his old quick business-like step and sauntered along looking into the right and to the left carelessly as if he had not awaiting him at home his duties as the father of a family after a while he turned down the side street and his wife followed with growing astonishment she could not imagine where he was going just then a little flower girl passed by and offered him a yellow rose he stopped and looked at her mrs clinton could see that she was a grimy little girl with a shock of unkempt brown hair and a very dirty apron but mr clinton put his hand on her head and looked into her eyes then he gave her a penny and stooping down lightly kissed her hair bless you my dear he said and passed on end of section two Section three of Orientations. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lily Franda. Orientations by W. Somerset Maugham. Section three. A bad example. Part two. Well, I never, said Mrs. Clinton, quite aghast and as she walked by the flower girl snorted at her and looked so savagely that the poor little maiden quite started mr clinton walked very slowly stopping now and then to look at a couple of women seated on a doorstep or the children round an ice-cream stall mrs clinton saw him pay a penny and give an eye to a little child who was looking with longing eyes at his more fortunate companions as they licked out the little glass cups he remained quite a long while watching half a dozen young girls dancing to the music of a barrel organ and again to his wife's disgust mr clinton gave money we shall end in the workhouse if this goes on muttered mrs clinton and she pursed up her lips more tightly than ever thinking of the explanation she meant to have when her maid came home at last mr clinton came to a narrow slum down which he turned and so filthy was it that the lady almost feared to follow but indignation curiosity and a stern sense of duty prevailed she went along with upturned nose making her way carefully between cabbages and other vegetable refuse sidling up against the house to avoid a dead cat which lay huddled up in the middle of the way with a great red wound in his head mrs clinton was disgusted to see her husband enter a public house is this where he gets to she said to herself and looking through the door saw him talk with two or three rough men who were standing at the bar drinking forth but she waited determinedly she had made up her mind to see the matter to the end came what might she was willing to wait all night after a time he came out and going through a narrow passage made his way into an alley 
then he went straight up to a, a big boned coarse featured woman in a white apron who was standing at an open door and when he had said a few words to her the two entered the house and the door was closed behind them mrs clinton suddenly saw it all i am deceived she said tragically and she crackled with virtuous indignation her first impulse was to knock furiously at the door and force her way in to bear her james away from the clutches of the big-boned siren but she feared that her rival would meet her with brute force and the possibility of defeat made her see the unlazy likeness of the proceeding so she turned on her heel holding up her skirts and her nose against the moral contamination and made her way out of the low place she walked tempestuously down to fleet street jumped fiercely on a bus frantically caught the train to camberwell and having reached the house in the adonis road flung herself furiously down on a chair and gasped oh then she got ready for her husband's return well she said when he came in and she looked daggers well i'm afraid i'm later than usual my dear it was in fact past nine o'clock don't talk to me she replied with a vigorous jerk of her head i know what you've been up to what do you mean my love he gently asked she positively snorted with indignation she had rolled her handkerchief into a ball and nervously dabbed the palms of her hands with it i followed you this afternoon and i saw you go into that house with that low woman what now eh she spoke with the greatest possible emphasis woman said mr clinton with a smile what are you to me don't call me woman said mrs clinton very angrily what am i to you i'm your wife and i've got the marriage certificate in my pocket at this moment she slapped her pocket loudly i'm your wife and you ought to be ashamed of yourself wife you are no more to me than any other woman and you have the audacity to tell me that to my face oh you you villain i won't stand it i tell you i won't stand it i know i can't get a divorce the laws of england are scandalous but i'll have a judicious separation i might have known it you're like every one of you that's how you men treat women you take advantage of their youth and beauty and then oh you villain here if i worked myself to the bone for you and brought up your children and i don't know what i haven't done and now you go and take home some woman and leave me oh she burst into tears mr clinton still smiled and there was a curious look in his eyes woman woman he said you know not what you say he went up to his wife and laid his hand on her shoulder dry your tears he said and i will tell you of these things mrs clinton shook herself angrily keeping her face buried in her pocket handkerchief but he turned away without paying more attention to her then standing in front of the glass he looked at himself earnestly and began to speak it was during my illness that my eyes were opened lying in bed through those long hours i thought of the poor souls whose tale i had heard in the coroner's court and all night i saw their dead faces i thought of the misery of mankind and of the hardness of men's arts then a ray of light came to me and i called for a bible and i read and read and the light grew into a great glow and i saw that man was not meant to live for himself alone that there was nothing else in life and it was man's duty to the elvis fellas and i resolved when i was well to do all that in me lay to help the poor and the wretched faithfully to carry out those precepts which the book had taught me oh dear oh dear sobbed mrs clinton who had looked up and listened with astonishment to her husband's speech oh dear oh dear what is he talking about mr clinton turned towards her and again put his hand on her shoulder that is how i spend my time amy i go into the most miserable houses into the dirtiest holes the foulest alleys and i seek to make men happier i do what i can to help them in their distress and to show them that brilliant light which i see so gloriously lighting the way before me and now good night he stretched out his arm and for a moment let his hand rest above her head 
Then, turning on his heel, he left the room. Next day, Mrs. Clinton called on the doctor and told him of her husband's strange behaviour. The doctor slowly and meditatively nodded. Then he raised his eyebrows and with his finger significantly tapped his head. Well, he said, I think you'd better wait a while and see how things go on. I'll just write a prescription, and you can give him the medicine three times a day after meals. And he ordered the unhappy Mr. Clinton and other tonic, which, if it had no effect on that gentleman, considerably reassured his wife. Mr. Clinton, in fact, became worse. He came home later and later every night, and his wife was disgusted at the state of uncleanness which his curious wanderings brought about. He refused to take the bath which Mrs. Clinton prepared for him. He was more silent than ever, but when he spoke it was in biblical language, and always hovered on his lips an enigmatical smile, and his eyes always had a strange disconcerting look. Mrs. Clinton perseveringly made him take his medicine, but she lost faith in his power when, one night at twelve, Mr. Clinton brought home with him a very dirty, ragged man who looked half-starved and smelled distinctly alcoholic. Jim, she said, on seeing the miserable objects linking in behind her husband. Jim, what's that? That, Amy, that is your brother. My brother? What do you mean? cried Mrs. Clinton, firing up. That's no brother of mine. I haven't got a brother. Is your brother and my brother? Be good to him. I tell you, it isn't my brother, repeated Mrs. Clinton. My brother Adolphus died when he was two years old, and that's the only brother I ever had. Mr. Clinton merely looked at her with his usual gentle expression, and she asked angrily, What have you brought him here for? He's angry, and I'm going to give him food. He's homeless, and I'm going to give him shelter. Shelter? Where? Here. In my house. In my bed. In my bed, screamed Mrs. Clinton. Not if I know it. Here you, she said, addressing the man, and pushing past her husband. Out you get. I'm not going to have trams and lovers in my house. Get out. Mrs. Clinton was an energetic woman, and a strong one. Catching hold of her husband's stick and flourishing it, she opened the front door. Amy, Amy, expostulated Mr. Clinton. Now then, you be quiet. I've had about enough of you. Get on out, will you? The man made a rush for the door, and as he scrambled down the steps, she caught him a smart blow on the back and slammed the door behind him. Then, returning to the sitting room, she sank panting on a chair. Mr. Clinton slowly recovered from his surprise. Woman, he said, this being now his usual mode of address, he spoke solemnly and sadly. You have cast out your brother. You've cast out your husband. You've cast out yourself. Don't talk to me, said Mrs. Clinton, very wrathfully. It's bedtime now. Come along upstairs. I will not come to your bed again. You have refused it to one who was better than I, and why should I have it? Go, woman, go and leave me. Now then, don't come trying your ears on me, said Mrs. Clinton. They won't wash. Come up to bed. I tell you I will not, replied Mr. Clinton decisively. Go, woman, and leave me. Well, if I do, I shan't leave the light. So there, she said spitefully, and taking the lamp, left Mr. Clinton in darkness. Mrs. Clinton was not henceforth on the very best of terms with her husband, but he always treated her with his accustomed gentleness, though he insisted on spending his nights on the dining-room sofa. But perhaps the most objectionable to Mrs. Clinton of all her good man's eccentricities was that he no longer gave her his week's money every Saturday afternoon, as he had been accustomed to do. The coldness between them made her unwilling to say anything about it, but the approach of court a day forced her to pocket her dignity and ask for the money. Oh, James, she no longer called him Jimmy. Will you give me the money for the rent? Money, he answered with the usual smile on his lips. I have no money. What do you mean? 
You've not given me a farthing for ten weeks. I've given it to those who want it more than I. You don't mean to tell me that you've given your salary away? Yes, dear. Mrs. Clinton groaned. Oh, you dotty. I can understand giving a threepenny bit or even sixpence at an offertory on Sunday at church, and of course one has to give Christmas boxes to the tradesmen, but to give your whole salary away? Haven't you got anything left? No. You, you aggravating fool, and I'll be bound you gave it to lazy loafers and trams and lot knows what. Mr. Glitter did not answer. His wife walked rapidly backwards and forwards, wringing her hands. Well, look here, James, she said at last. It's no use crying over spilt milk. But from this day, you just give me your salary the moment you receive it. Shall you hear? I tell you I will not have any more of your nonsense. I shall get no more salaries, he quietly remarked. Mrs. Clinton looked at him. He was quite calm and smilingly returned her glance. What do you mean by that? she asked. I'm no longer at the office. James, you haven't been sacked, she screamed. Oh, they say I did not any longer properly attend to my work. They said I was careless and that I made mistakes. They complained that I was unpunctual, that I went late and came away early. And one day, because I hadn't been there the day before, they told me to leave. I was watching at the bedside of a man who was dying and had need of me. So, how could I go? But I didn't really mind. The office hindered me in my work. But what are you going to do now? gasped Mrs. Clinton. I have my work. That is more important than ten thousand offices. But how are you going to earn your living? What's to become of us? Don't trouble me about those things. Come with me and work for the poor. James, think of the children. What are your children to me more than any other children? But, woman, I tell you not to trouble me about these things. Have you not money enough and to spare? He waved his hand and putting on his top hat, which looked more than ever in need of restoration, went out, leaving his wife in a perfect agony. There was worse to follow, coming home a few days later. Mr. Clinton told his wife that he wished to speak with her. I have been looking into my books, he said, and I find that we have invested in various securities a sum of nearly seven hundred pounds. Thank heaven for that, answered his wife. It's the only thing that'll save us from starvation now that you moon about all day instead of working like a decent man. Well, I've been thinking. I've been reading. I've found it written. Give all and follow me. Well, there's nothing new in that, said Mrs. Clinton viciously. I've known that text ever since I was a child. And as it were spirits, it's come to me and said that I too must give all. In short, I've determined to sell out my stocks and my shares. My breweries are seven pounds higher than when I bought them. I knew it was a good investment. I'm going to realize everything. I'm going to take the money in my hand, and I'm going to give it to the poor. Mrs. Clinton burst into tears. Do not weep, he said solemnly. It is my duty, and it is a pleasant one. Oh, what joy to make a hundred people happy, to leave a poor man who is starving, to give a breath of country air to little children who are dying for the want of it, to help the poor, to feed the hungry, to clothe the naked. Oh, if I only had a million pounds! He stretched out his arms in a gesture of embrace and looked towards heaven with an aesthetic smile upon his lips. It was too serious a matter for Mrs. Clinton to waste any words on. She ran upstairs, put on her bonnet, and quickly walked to her friend, the doctor. He looked graver than ever when she told him. Well, he said, I'm afraid it's very serious. I've never heard of anyone doing such a thing before. Of course I've known of people who have left all their money to charities after their death, when they didn't want it. But it couldn't ever occur to a normal healthy man to do it in his lifetime. But what shall I do, doctor? Mrs. Clinton was almost in hysterics. Well, Mrs. Clinton, do you know the clergyman of the parish? 
I know Mr. Evans, the curate, very well. He's a very nice gentleman. Perhaps you could get him to have a talk with your husband. The fact is, it's a sort of religious mania he's got, and perhaps a clergyman could talk him out of it. Anyhow, it's worth trying. Mrs. Clinton straightway went to Mr. Evans's rooms, explained to him the case, and settled that on the following day he should come and see what he could do with her husband. In expectation of the curious visit, Mrs. Clinton tidied the house and adorned herself. It has been said that she was a woman of taste, and so she was. The mantelpiece and looking-glass were artistically draped with green muslin, and this she proceeded to arrange, tying and carefully forming the yellow satin ribbon with which it was relieved. The chairs were covered with cretonne, which might have come from the Tottenham Court Road, and these she placed in positions of careless and artistic confusion, smoothing down the antimascasas, which were now her pride, as the silk petticoat from which she had manufactured them had been once her glory. For the flower pots she made fresh coverings of red tissue paper, rearranged the ornaments gracefully scattered about on little Japanese tables. Then, after pausing a moment to admire her work and see that nothing had been left undone, she went upstairs to perform her own toilet. In less than half an hour she reappeared, holding herself in a dignified posture, with her head slightly turned to one side, and her hands meekly folded in front of her, stately and collected as Juno, a goddess in black satin. Her dress was very elegant, it might have typified her own life, for in its original state of virgin whiteness it had been her wedding garment. Then it was dyed purple, and might have betokened a sense of change and coming responsibilities. Lastly, it was black, to signify the burden of a family and the seriousness of life. No one had realised so intensely as Mrs. Clinton the truth of the poet's words. Life is not an empty dream. She took out her handkerchief, redolent with lascivious patchouli, and placed it in her bosom, a spot of whiteness against the black. She sat herself down to wait. There was a knock and a ring at the door, timid, as befitted the clergyman, and the servant girl showed in Mr. Evans. He was a thin and short young man, red-faced, with a long nose and weak eyes, looking underfat and cold keeping his shoulders screwed up in a perpetual shiver. He was an earnest, God-fearing man, spending much money in charities, and waging constant war against the encroachments of the scarlet woman. I think I'll just take my coat off, if you don't mind, Mrs. Clinton, he said, after the usual greetings. He folded it carefully, and hung it over the back of a chair. Then, coming forward, he sat down and rubbed the back of his hands, I asked my husband to stay in because you wanted to see him, but he would go out. However, Mrs. Clinton always chose her language on such occasions. However, he's promised to return at four, and he will say this for me. He never breaks his word. Oh, very well. May I have the pleasure of offering you a cup of tea, Mr. Evans? The curious face brightens up. Oh, thank you so much. And he rubbed his hands more energetically than ever. Tea was brought in, and they drank it, talking of parish matters. Mrs. Clinton, discreetly trying to pump the curate, was it really true that Mrs. Palmer of Number 17 Adonis Road drank so terribly? At last, Mr. Clinton came, and his wife glided out of the room, leaving the curate to convert him. There was a little pause while Mr. Evans took stock of the clerk. Well, Mr. Clinton, he said finally, I've come to talk to you about yourself. Your wife tells me that you have adopted certain curious views on religious matters, and she wished me to have some conversation with you about them. You are a man of God, replied Mr. Clinton. I'm at your service. Mr. Evans, on principle, objected to the use of the deity's name out of church, thinking it a little blasphemous, but he said nothing. Well, he said, of course, religion is a very good thing. In fact, it is the very best thing, but it must not be abused, Mr. Clinton, and he repeated gravely, as if his interlocutor were a naughty schoolboy. 
it mustn't be abused now i want to know exactly what your views are mr clinton smiled gently i have no views sir the only rule i have for guidance is this love thy neighbour as thyself hm murmured the curate there was really nothing questionable in that but he was just slightly prejudiced against the man who made such a quotation he sounded a little prickish but your wife tells me that you've been going about with all sorts of queer people i found that there was misery and unhappiness among people and i tried to relieve it of course i strongly approve of district visiting i do a great deal of it myself but you've been going about with public-house loafers and bad women is it not said i am not come to call the righteous but sinners to repentance no doubt answered mr evans slightly frowning but obviously one isn't meant to do that to such an extent as to be dismissed from one's place my wife has posted you well up in all my private affairs well i don't think you can have done well to be sent away from your office is it not said forsake all and follow me decidedly this was bad form and mr evans pursing up his lips and raising his eyebrows was silent that's the worst of these half-educated people he said to himself they get some idea in their hearts which they don't understand and of course they do idiotic things well to pass over all that he added out loud apparently you've been spending your money on these people to such an extent that your wife and children are actually inconvenienced by it i have clothed the naked said mr clinton looking into the curious eyes i have visited the sick i have given food to him that was an angered and drink to him that was a thirst yes 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 that's all very well but you should always remember that charity begins at home i shouldn't have anything to say to a rich man doing these things but it's positively wicked for you to do them don't you understand that and last of all your wife tells me that you are realizing your property with the idea of giving it away it's perfectly true said mr clinton mr evans's mind was too truly pious for a wicked expletive to cross it but the bad man expressing the curious feeling would have said that mr clinton was a damned fool well don't you see that it's a perfectly ridiculous and unheard-of thing he asked emphatically sell all that thou hast and distribute unto the poor it is in the gospel of st luke do you know it of course i know it but naturally these things aren't to be taken quite literally it is clearly written what makes you say it is not to be taken literally mr evans shrugged his shoulders impatiently why do you see it would be impossible the world couldn't go on how do you expect your children to live if you give this money away look at the lilies of the field they toil not neither do they spin yet solomon in all his glory was not arrayed as one of these oh my dear sir you make me lose my patience you are full of the hell-fire platitudes of a park spouter and you think it's religion i tell you all these things are allegorical don't you understand that you mustn't carry them out to the letter they are not meant to be taken in that way mr clinton smiled a little pitifully at the curate and think of yourself one must think of oneself god helps those who help themselves how are you going to exist when this little money of yours is gone you simply have to go to the workhouse it's absurd i tell you mr clinton took no further notice of the curate but he broke into a loud chant lay not up for yourselves treasures upon the earth where moth and rust doth corrupt and where thieves break through and steal but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt and where thieves do not break through nor steal then turning on the unhappy curate he stretched out his arm and pointed his finger at him last sunday he said i heard you read those very words from the chancel steps go go i tell you go you are a bad man a wolf in sheep's clothing go mr clinton walked up to him threateningly and the curate with a gasp of astonishment and indignation fled from the room he met mrs clinton outside i can't do anything with him at all he said angrily i've never heard such things in my life 
he's either mad or he's got into the hands of the dissenters that's the only explanation i can offer then to quiet his feelings he called on a wealthy female parishioner with whom he was a great favourite because she thought him such a really pious man and it was not till he had drunk two cups of tea that he recovered his equilibrium mrs clinton was at her wit's end her husband had sold out his shares and the money was lying at the bank ready to be put to its destined use visions of debt and bankruptcy presented themselves to her she saw her black satin dress in the roofless clutches of a pawnbroker the house and furniture sold over her hat the children down at hill and herself driven to work for her living needlework nursing charring what might not things come to however she went to the doctor and told him of the failure of their scheme i've come to the end of my tether mrs clinton i really don't know what to do the only thing i can suggest is that a mental specialist should examine into the state of his mind i really think he's wrong in his head and you know it may be necessary for your welfare and his own that he be kept under restriction well doctor answered mrs clinton putting her handkerchief up to her eyes and beginning to cry well doctor of course i shouldn't like him to be shut up it seems a terrible thing and i shall never have a moment's peace all the rest of my life but if he must be shut up for heaven's sake let it be done at once before the money's gone and here she began to sob very violently the doctor said he would immediately write to the specialist so that they might hold a consultation on mr clinton the very next day so the following morning mrs clinton again put on her black satin dress and further sent to her grocer's for a bottle of sherry her inner consciousness giving her to understand that specialists expected something of the kind the specialist came he was a tall untidily dressed man with his hair wild and straggling as if he had just got out of bed he was very clever and very impatient of stupid people and he seldom met any one whom he did not think in one way or another intensely stupid mr clinton as before had gone out but mrs clinton did her best to entertain the two doctors the specialist who talked most incessantly himself was extremely impatient of other people's conversation why on earth don't people see that they are much more interesting when they hold their tongues than when they speak he was in the habit of saying and immediately would pour out a deluge of words emphasizing and explaining the point giving instances of his truth you must see a lot of strange things doctor said mrs clinton amiably yes answered the specialist i think it must be very interesting to be a doctor said mrs clinton yes yes you must see a lot of strange things yes yes repeated the doctor and as mrs clinton went on complacently he frowned and drummed his fingers on the table and looked to the right and left when is the man coming in he asked impatiently and at last he could not contain himself if you don't mind mrs clinton i should like to talk to your doctor alone about the case you can wait in the next room i'm sure i don't wish to intrude said mrs clinton bridling up and she rose in a dignified manner from her chair she thought his manners were distinctly queer but of course she said to her friend afterwards he's a genius there's no mistaking it and people like that are always very eccentric what an insufferable woman he began when the lady had retired talking very rapidly only stopping to take an occasional breath i thought she was going on all night she's enough to drive the man mad one couldn't get a word in edgeways why on earth doesn't this man come just like these people they don't think that my time's valuable you expect she drinks shocking you know these women how they drink and still talking he looked at his watch for the eighth time in ten minutes well my men he said as mr clinton at last came in what are you complaining of one moment he added as mr clinton was about to reply he opened his notebook and took out a stylographic pen now i'm ready for you what are you complaining of i'm complaining that the world is out of joint answered mr clinton with a smile the specialist raised his eyebrows and significantly looked at the family doctor 
it's astonishing how much you can get by a well-directed question he said to him taking no notice of mr clinton some people go floundering about for hours but you see by one question i get on the track turning to the patient again he said ah and do you see things certainly i see you i don't mean that impatiently said the specialist distinctly stupid you know he added to his colleague i mean do you see things that other people don't see alas yes i see folly stalking abroad on a obios do you really anything else said the doctor making a note of the fact i see wickedness and vice beating the land with their wings see things beating with their wings wrote down the doctor i see misery and unhappiness everywhere indeed said the doctor has delusions do you think your wife puts things in your tea yes ah joyfully uttered the doctor that's what i wanted to get at things people are trying to poison him what is it they put in my man milk and sugar answered mr clinton very dull mentally said the specialist in an undertone to his colleague well i don't think we need go into any more details there's no doubt about it you know that curious look in his eyes and the smile the smile's quite typical it all clearly points to insanity and then that absurd idea of giving his money to the poor i've heard of people taking money away from the poor there's nothing mad in that but the other why it's a proof of insanity itself and then your account of his movements his giving ice creams to children most pernicious things those ice creams the government ought to put a stop to them extraordinary idea to think of reforming the world with ice cream post enteric insanity you know mad as a hatter well well i must be off still talking he put on his hat and talked all the way downstairs and finally talked himself out of the house the family doctor remained behind to see mrs clinton yes it's just as i said he told her he's not responsible for his actions i think he's been insane ever since his illness when you think of his behaviour since then his going among those common people and trying to reform them and his ideas about feeding the hungry and clothing the naked and finally wanting to give his money to the poor it all points to a completely deranged mind mrs clinton heaved a deep sigh and what do you think had better be done now she asked well i'm very sorry mrs clinton of course it's a great blow to you but really i think arrangements had better be made for him to be put under restraint mrs clinton began to cry and the doctor looked at her compassionately ah well she said at last if it must be done i suppose it had better be done at once and i shall be able to save the money after all at the thought of this she dried her tears the morrow is plain End of section three.